Today we are talking about the novel called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey. It was published in 1962 and is set in a mental asylum in the 50s. The main character of the novel, Chief Bromden, supposedly has schizophrenia, but in 1961, psychiatrist Thomas Zazaz's book, The Myth of Mental Illness, argues that there is no such disease as schizophrenia. Weird, right? I found the book interesting for many reasons, but I really like learning about the different illnesses that the patient suffered from and trying to diagnose them myself before the author revealed the true illness. I agree, and also liked that we got to see things from Bromden's point of view. It made things more interesting to see how his mind works. Yeah, it was good to get a different perspective and try to understand what his hallucinations represented. The novel included many unique patients with specific illnesses, which was strange because the majority of them were in the ward out of their own free will. Most of the patients in the novel were in the ward voluntarily. In 1967, the Lantern Man Petrus Short Act was created, which made involuntary hospitalization a lot harder. I found that there are many differences in the mental health area now, including the stigma around it, procedures used, services available, and how it used to impact patients based on the novel. Well, I found when reading the novel that the workers are using these procedures as a form of punishment instead of an actual care. Yeah, and this is also affecting the progress and well-being of the patients. Instead of actually caring for them and promoting rehabilitation and release, these characters are being used as entertainment for the workers. For example, under several conditions, the treatments for the patients were used as punishment instead of care. Not to mention, they were fairly cruel and unusual. I thought the whole point of being put in a mental asylum is to eventually recover and be released back into society. The worst part is that the whole point of mental care is to be able to function in society. But this ward and time period is not what the main focus was about even though most say that it was, including the workers and staff. It was almost like it was this big game for the workers and the patients were meaningless to them and that's why they treated them so poorly. Some treatments that were actually used came with fairly severe side effects. And some of the treatments used by the workers in the novel were quite... shocking. <laughs> I see what you did there. Anyways... One example was the lobotomy procedure. Lobotomy was when the doctor would cut away part of the brain to cause behavioral changes or improvements in personality. The most serious one to me is actually the medication. The dosage that is given to the patients put them in this mental state where they are not aware of what's going on around them, so much so that some of them are not even capable of communicating. I also remember reading that in some cases, the patients were so heavily sedated that they were not able to establish motorized functions. Another very common treatment used in the ward was electroshock therapy. They mainly used this treatment as a form of punishment, making the experience for them terrifying instead of beneficial. I find that so horrible. Isn't the idea of treatment to actually treat the patient, not make them worse? The staff would restrain the patient so that they would hold still while hooking them up to a series of wires to send electric shock waves through the brain to induce seizures. The idea was that when they were finished with the seizure, they would be calmer and more manageable. The comparison of what mental health care is now to what it was back then has improved substantially. The procedures back then contained everything that was mentioned in the novel, such as lobotomy, medication, and electroshock therapy. Some of the other services that were offered that we found were different types of therapy that isn't included in the novel. They provided assistance with housing outside in the community, job training so that they would be employable, along with life skills and social support. Also, some new drugs introduced that we researched and found that they did not help to cure the mental illness, but controlled the symptoms. So they weren't curing the patient, only temporarily helping them. If we were to compare the procedures and technology back then to the present day, there would be a huge difference. I heard, though, that even some former methods are still practiced today. For example, the electric shock therapy is still used daily in today's society and shows successful results in rehabilitating and helping patients. Yes, but with more safety precautions, such as anesthetics to sedate the patient and provide a better experience. 
Since the 1950s, medications have improved a lot. Now, medications have different and fewer side effects and are more catered towards each specific patient. Back then, asylums were not very big. In some cases, homeless people were sent to asylums during the winter to keep warm and were released once the spring came. This resulted in asylums to become overcrowded, so there was less care for patients and larger buildings were built. On a similar note, back then there was not a lot of money available for these organizations to expand or hire more staff. Today, the government puts about $7.9 billion into mental health care. There was not enough care available for patients in need. As we researched, about 10 to 20 percent of youth is affected by mental disabilities today. The statistics haven't changed that much over time, and many of these children were not properly treated. Another interesting fact is that mental disorders increase the risk of getting ill from other diseases such as HIV, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and more. So, back then, more people were suffering from these diseases as there were no sufficient treatments. New, larger buildings and residency with better organization and division have been made. Now, institutions are divided into maximum security, medium security, and minimum security. Once a patient has been deemed fit to live in society, they are able to find housing in the community with someone checking in on them weekly or even monthly to ensure they are taking medications and succeeding in day-to-day -day activities. Structure for patients is still in place as it can be better to have consistency within the facility. On regards to counseling, there is now a different approach that benefits the patient while being in a comforting and safe space with a professional therapist. Also, the education inside and outside of the facility has strongly progressed. Within the facility, education is now offered and is encouraged, where previously it wasn't a requirement or even an option for the patients. And outside of the facility, there are programs and people who can help families with loved ones that are mentally ill and provide them with support, as well as information regarding mental health. In the new facilities, dieting and exercise programs have been installed to maintain the patient's physical health while being treated for a mental illness as well. Certain foods are prepared for each patient's needs. We found that there are many forms of treatments, procedures, and overall support and help that is offered to those in need of mental care. Some examples that we didn't discuss are psychotherapy, vocational programs, occupational therapy, social skill programs, ECT, electrocompulsive therapy, light therapy, creative outlets, psychotherapy, and especially trauma care. Vocational therapy is for the patients who may have speech impediments or have been affected by medication and treatments regarding their speech. I think that vocational therapy is especially important because it is almost always a requirement for jobs. Social skill therapy is also necessary as if the patient has been in care for a long time. They may have issues back in the community. I agree. Things that would be okay to do or say in their ward may not be appropriate elsewhere. It may have been okay to make a comment about mental illness in the hospital, but outside of it could be considered as dark humor or satire. On the topic of satirization, the novel is one big satire for specifically mental care. Yes, it constantly satires mental illness and the care and procedures used for mental illnesses. Some examples are in their treatment and procedures, their doctors and nurses, the abuse of authority, and mental illnesses in general. For the treatments and procedures, the staff don't see the treatments as a big deal, so they undermine what is actually going on. Because they are so used to harsh, cruel forms of treatment, they don't react in a calming manner towards the patient, but instead more aggressively. I completely agree, and this is what the nurses and doctors do on a daily basis. They use the procedures as either a form of punishment or for a discovery. They completely undermine the patient and their well-being and are frankly just selfish. In this novel, authority is a huge key factor and the abusive behavior that comes along with it is even worse. I can tell you, Nurse Ratchet is probably the worst. I can second that. 
She is constantly bossing around everyone, including the patients, and she uses her power to her benefit rather than the other workers or even the patients. Because she is seen as an authority figure, people follow and obey what she says and does, but instead of being a caring leader, she is cruel and obsessed with the power and control she obtains from the job. I found that even mental illness was satirized in the novel because of the characters and personalities of them in the story. The men constantly make fun of each other and their mental stability in the group meetings or even just around the ward. The staff make fun of them as well. You would think that the workers are trying to help them, but instead they are really just bringing them down. So that is it for today regarding the novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey. Tune in next week for a discussion on why Mr. Berzal is the greatest teacher in the entire world. Thanks for listening.